Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. With me today is Dave Bogan from Chasbo Music, which is a company that specializes in offline video delivery, something very, very unique and very cool. But first of all, let's talk about Shakira. Interestingly enough, she just passed 100 million likes on Facebook recently. That's 100 million. And she is the first celebrity to do so. As a matter of fact, there's only two other entities that have passed 100 million likes, and they both belong to Facebook. So this is very significant for a lot of reasons. First of all, she hit that number mostly thanks to the World Cup. She had an appearance on the World Cup. She's very, very big outside of this country. As a matter of fact, only 11% of her fans are in the United States, and the rest of the world is basically her oyster. So she was very, very big in the rest of the world thanks to the World Cup. But she already had a huge following, so that wasn't the only reason. Understand that 100 million likes is about 8% of all Facebook traffic, which is really, really significant. And also, she only had about 340,000 five years ago. So this has happened in a slow growth over the years. But now she's become bigger than just about anybody. That being said, Eminem is right behind her at 90-some million. And Rihanna is right behind that with 88, I think. So they're neck and neck. And over time, they're going to pass 100 million as well. The interesting thing about this is the fact that Facebook is no longer the service that it used to be. So once upon a time, you could reach your total audience. If you had 1,000 fans, for instance, you can reach all 1,000 of them with a post. And then Facebook initiated a Google-like algorithm called EdgeRank that determined how many people were going to see your post based upon mostly how pertinent your post was to the rest of your fans. If they deemed it something that was relevant, then more people would see it. And if they felt that it wasn't, then less people would see it, which is kind of a problem because then all of a sudden, instead of being able to reach all 1,000 of your fans, now it was down to somewhere between 12 and 15%, which meant that now you're looking at 150 of those fans at most. Well, over the last year, that has dropped down to about 6%. So that means if you have 100 fans, you can guarantee that you'll reach six of them with a post. And you may reach more of them depending on how EdgeRank looks at that particular post. Now, the reason why Facebook did this is so it forces you into buying advertising or promoting your post for money that, of course, they get. Now, of course, you can promote any post. And the problem is if you just use the promote this post tool that's on top of any Facebook post that you have, that's kind of like the amateur way of doing it. Really, if you want it to be effective, you have to go into the ad manager. And if you're really a pro, you go into something called the power editor. And this gives you a lot more flexibility, but then you're able to actually zero in on all of your fans. And if you want, you can zero in on the fans of your fans. And if you really want, you can zero in on just about anything from a zip code to a certain city, to a certain country, to a certain topic. So this becomes something that's very, very powerful, but the only problem is you have to pay for it. So someone like Shakira doesn't have to worry about this because she has a huge fan base. But for the rest of us, we have to resort to paying to reach our customers, to reach our fans, which is kind of a drag. But uh, until things change, that's the way it is. The next thing I want to talk about is high-end expensive cables and if and how they improve your sound. Now, I was a skeptic on this, and I've written a lot of posts about it, as a matter of fact. But a while back, I had Larry Smith from Wireworks Pro Audio on the podcast, and he did his best to explain to me why high-end cables actually will make a difference and why they're worth the money. To make a long story short, he sent me a bunch of cables to play with, and these were all sorts of different kinds. They were XLR cables, microphone cables. They were musical instrument cables. There was even some power cables. I did a couple of different things. The first thing is I used the AC cables and I used the interconnects to hook up my powered monitors. And you know what? I was shocked. It actually does make a difference. And what I noticed was a clarity that wasn't there before. 
And the other thing was a punch. The low end wasn't as round. It was very defined. And there was a little more bottom than there was there before. There, there was something just a little lower than was there. So I have to say I was a skeptic, but I've changed my mind. It really sounds good. Now, I wasn't the only person. I had enough cables that I spread them around to some of my studio pals and to some studio musicians that I know, and they all came back with the same thing. They all said, wow, I can hear the difference. It does make a difference. Problem was some people actually felt it made too much of a difference. And for instance, they got too much high end. It was more than they were used to. And this is especially with guitar players. Sometimes it wasn't the sound they were listening to. The one thing I can tell you that was interesting was I heard the sound on a guitar amp without even plugging my guitar in. What I did was the thing that you should never do is I plugged one end into the amplifier first. And then I just touched the end of the quarter inch jack. And you know what? It was the funniest thing. I could hear the difference just in the buzz. <laughs> Hard to believe, but it was cleaner and clearer. And then when I plugged it in, there was a clarity that wasn't there before. There's no question about it. The interesting thing is all of these cables had uh, different ends. And one of the things that Wireworks Pro Audio has been working on for a while is the quarter inch plug that's on all the guitar cables. And we're used to the Switchcraft been around for ages and more recently the Neutrik and they felt that they could do a better job. In fact they have. They're cooler ends and they supposedly make a difference in how everything sounds. I can't tell you for sure how much those ends make a difference but I can tell you that the cables in general do make a difference. They do sound worth the money. So the next time you see something like that you see high-end cables don't be a skeptic because Believe it or not, they do work, and they work well. If you have any questions or comments, please send them to questions at bobbyoinnercircle.com, questions at bobbyoinnercircle.com. My guest today is Dave Bogan, who truly is a social media expert. There's so few of them around really true social media experts. Day is one of them. He's also a champion for the indie artist, and he helps indie artists, when he can anyway, because he's busy with other things, he helps them with uh, their social media. The other thing that Day specializes in is offline video distribution in retail stores and college campuses, among other things, and you're going to hear him tell you how he does that via the interview that we did together via Skype. So Day, thanks for being with me today. It's kind of you to take some time out. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Let's start by... Uh, if you can tell us about Chasbo Music, how that got going and what you do exactly, because you have a very unique position in the business of social media, what you're doing. It, it, it's a unique service, I think, and, and there's not too many that do the same thing. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, it, it, it got started um, back when I was the head of marketing and music programs at Chic Shoes. Uh, the idea started to come to me because at Chic, uh, part of my role as the head of music programs was curating all the music videos for our stores. And, uh, you know, when you, a lot of people don't realize when you go shopping, you know, you visit a store, even if you go to a, a coffee shop, especially like Coffee Bean, for example, you, there's music videos playing uh, in the background on, on TVs, on kiosks throughout the store. And that was part of my responsibility, curating music videos for uh, over 130 locations in the U.S. And, uh, you know, Part of my role was working with labels, directly brokering deals, uh, content acquisition, getting the videos from them, getting the videos packaged, and then sent to the stores so they can play. Some of the challenges I uh, faced was, number one, getting music videos in the first place, um, you know, in a timely fashion so that the, so that the music is still fresh and, and new, and then getting those videos uh, packaged into a uh, DVD format and then sent to the stores. And uh, some of the challenges we face at the store level is, you know, stores will play the DVDs every day, obviously, that's a, and these DVDs looped all day long. And over time, they'll scratch, they'll get broken. Um, and it was, a, it was a challenge to really keep up with uh, the demand uh, of the quantity of, of new uh, videos, um, as well as, you know, keeping the, uh, the store satisfied with uh, DVDs. So we'd go sometimes several months 
with the same DVD of just a few uh, music videos. So I thought to myself, to look at my contact at Universal, there must be a more efficient way of getting music videos from the label onto our screens. And, um, and I guess even to backtrack before that, the reason why we did it direct in-house is because um, the services that existed in the marketplace that do provide music, music services to, to businesses just didn't fit the business needs for this particular retail chain. So I had to come up with our own solution in-house. Um, and I started thinking about how do I automate this process? How do I make it more efficient? How do I make the whole process more streamlined? As opposed to calling up my rep at, at, at Universal, having them pull deep, uh, music videos from the, the various labels uh, at Universal, and then compile a DVD and then duplicate the DVD and send it via uh, shipment. So I started thinking about uh, ways of doing this all online. And um, before I really came up with the, finished coming up developing an idea, I ultimately ended up you know, leaving uh, Chic Shoes, and uh, which gave me the freedom to develop. Chapel music, or you know, kind of their concept, and um, so, you know, I wanted to make sure that there was a platform for independent artists to be able to get their music videos into stores, and I also wanted to make sure it was cost efficient to the stores because one of the challenges, you know, as we see right now in the music industry, is getting businesses to understand the value of music. Um, and, and, and understanding the difference also between being a business buying music and being an individual buying music and the cost differences there. Um, so Chasm Music started as, as, as a way to promote independent music uh, in retail stores through an online delivery system. And I built it from scratch uh, via uh, um, uh, different solutions, uh, completely bootstrap, no investors, um, and pitched it to Chic Shoes, which was my previous employer. And after weeks of discussions and everyone was on board and we, we initially started testing uh, five locations in Los Angeles back in 2012. And then after uh, a period of testing, we, were, we got the green light to roll it out across the company. And I spent several months traveling from city to city, physically connecting their TVs to their computers so that they could stream our service. In the so store. everything's delivered from the cloud then? It is a cloud-based cloud -based music service. Yeah. So, um, so over time, it has evolved to much more than that. Um, over time, we've um, done partnerships with various outlets to deliver videos uh, to or to pitch videos. Um, we worked with um, Incredible Tablet, which is Nick Cannon's um, device, which is actually launching this month. Uh, and then there's an app on there called Incredible TV, and it's a music video uh, app, app. We uh, create a content partnership deals with MySpace, with E uh, TV to create custom content on our channel so that when you go into the stores, not only are you watching music videos, but you might get some behind the scene uh, footage from a music video, uh, whether or an interview with an artist, things like that. Um, and kind of the big picture, and we're continuing, obviously, just since I've launched Shout Music, it's really what we've launched is really the, the research and development stage. Chatsville Music, from what people know today, and Chatsville Bridge product is essentially prototypes. Uh, it's not. It's not what. It's not what the. Uh, it's not the product that's envisioned. It's it's kind of constantly being developed based on research, feedback, um, and you know testing out features and and and, and functionalities. So where Chatsville Music is today is there's kind of two parts to it. The one, the heart of Chaswell Music is the platform Chaswell Bridge. And Chaswell Bridge, similar to what you mentioned, one upload uh, at, at our music video seminar, um, one upload allows content owners to upload a video and distribute those videos to different websites. Um, I think it's a great resource for promoting video content um, and advertisements. Um, but we focus on music oriented outlets and we focus on offline uh, platforms. So you know, TVs in, on college campuses, TVs in re retail stores, um, apps on mobile devices. Uh, we also are, so we can also submit to MTV Networks and BET and Revolt and much music. So we focus on music, uh, music-centric outlets, whether they're offline or broadcast or online. Uh, we don't necessarily do placement, individual placements on websites like One Upload does. Um, Who are your clients then? Yeah, so our clients are, um, we have th 
three constituents, really three groups of constituents. The first is the content owners, independent labels, independent artists. You know, we've over the last few years we've registered nearly 700 independent uh, content owners, and that's labels, that's artist management companies, that's unsigned artists in over 15 countries. And um, you know, they use Chatswell Bridge to view the outlets that we have partnerships with, view the details of the campaigns in terms of how long would a video uh, be on, on, on air or in rotation, um, how many you know, views they expect to get, how many impressions they expect to get, how many rotations of the video will they get. Uh, we provide analytics on the back end based on the performance of those campaigns. Um, and then there's, a, you know, there's pricing, obviously, on, uh, in terms of the cost of distributing to each outlet. Uh, so they see all that information and they, the content owner can set up campaigns, music video campaigns. So they can. You know, let's say it's an indie band from Minnesota. They just finished a, a, a video and they want to get it to um, MTVU. They want to get it to Incredible TV. They want to get it to SAE TV, which is um, our channel for SAE Institute um, and, and, and the uh, student lobbies. Um, or SHMACU, which is the network of college campuses in the US. Uh, so you can use our platform, select all these outlets, schedule, uh, you know, choose the date you want it to be delivered, and then you know, make their payment, and then essentially watch what's happening from the outlet in terms of uh, views and impressions and, and whatnot. So that's the content owner side. The other side are our outlet partners. Some of our outlet partners uh, were the exclusive music video curator. So they look to us to uh, bring in the video content for their for their solution, whatever whatever, whatever that may be. So if it's an app on a, on a, on a tablet like Incredible TV. Um, or this new channel we're talking to called New Music 360 on Flips. Uh, these are apps and they don't want to do direct content deals with distributors for various reasons. Um, and we think it's in the best interest of the artists to have direct deals with outlets in terms of, you know, uh, there's less people sliced up the royalty pie, if you will. Um, so we are a middleman between the content owners and the platforms. Uh, we're not a distributor. We don't keep any royalties. We don't keep any copyrights in, in, in their works. Um, so you can distribute directly to these outlets. Um, well, how does that work then? This is strictly promotional from a copyright owner's point of view then, right? It's not something they expect to get paid for in terms of, of uh, mechanicals or anything, performance rights. I mean. Well, they absolutely expect to get paid for it. <laughs> They, um, but they're paying for it. It doesn't offset, though, I, I would think, considering well, what they're paying. It, well, yes and no. Um, they expect to get paid for it just because that's where the industry is going in general with the use of music videos. Yeah. Right? Because of YouTube's your B-Bowls. Um, the, the deal with YouTube and, and, and MPA you know, a couple of years ago, I think it was two years ago. Um, so record labels do, no longer looks at music videos as solely promotional. They can monetize music videos. They can monetize them on YouTube. They can monetize them on Vivo. They can monetize them on Yahoo Music, LL, and, and, and MTV.com. Um, so there's a number of ways that music videos are being monetized today. Uh, and then obviously the songwriters and publishers expect to monetize videos as well. Um, the, the National Music Publishers Association uh, uh, you know, lawsuit against YouTube was kind of you know, champion. Uh, this new movement of hey, these aren't these aren't just promotional tools anymore. They are a relevant revenue source, and there is a licensing revenue that's being generated from music videos, um, and there's performance royalties uh, being generated, and there's mechanical royalties for platforms like iTunes that where you can actually purchase music videos. Um, so there are royalties being generated. There is revenue being generated. Um, we do report to ASCAP, BMI, and CSEC. Um, for the channels that we own, and then our outlet partners, we don't handle any of their uh, obligations in terms of, of, of publishing, uh, but they have their own uh, obligations and their own reporting. Uh, we report only on the performance, uh, which is good, which is good for a content owner to go back and double check. Hey, I see that report. You know, my my video did this kind of performance. Does that match up with the report that I'm getting from uh, whether it's your pro or your publisher or whatever case may be? I, I hear you're coming from on that, but on the other hand, someone is hiring you because they they want to reach an audience that they can't get any other way, right? 
that's the ultimate goal. I mean, that's the ultimate goal. This, this yeah. second goal is, of it is that, okay, and kind of a bonus, if you will, is that it is monetized. But the ultimate goal, the purpose of using our service, is not necessarily to monetize the video, the purpose of using our service is to generate exposure yeah. to you know, reach an audience that you can't, you can't reach and hopefully you know, convert that audience into a potential fans. So that's the purpose. We're our prom- promotional service. Um, and you know we're looking at analytics is important, data is important. You know knowing the performance of other content is important. Uh, and I think you know with some of our bigger partners, independent labels, and, and uh, you know they have departments in place to measure the performance of new media. Yeah. Um, so you know we're not. It's, it's no longer just hey get the video to a video promoter and get it out there and get it everywhere. But but you're not able to measure any kind of impact or measure any kind of effectiveness of the campaign. So so that's one of our big uh, uh, differentiating factors uh, between us and a lot of the traditional music video promoters and music videos uh, kind of pluggers is that we're analytic driven and you know we want to make sure that every campaign comes with some kind of reporting and on how it's performing. And then the bonus piece is the fact that you know it's it's monetized. Well, that's pretty cool. Uh, um, I would, uh, again, you're reaching an audience that you wouldn't, that if I were an artist, I would think I can't reach that audience easily or at all for that matter. Yeah. I mean, you know, people don't think, I mean, when you think about music consumption, you know, people think of the big three, right? You think of radio, uh, traditional, you know, terrestrial radio. You think of online, YouTube, and streaming services like Pandora. And you think of, TV still, you know, Revolt has done a great job with since their launch. Um, Fuse have launched, you know, several years ago. Uh, MTV still has MTV Jams, MTV Two, um, MTV U on college campuses. So you think of these traditional things, but people don't realize all of the background music that they consume every single day. Mm-hmm. You who go to malls and public, uh, youth-driven public places. Um, I've gone to malls and you see TVs in the food courts with music videos. Um, Aku launched a couple of years ago, and unfortunately they went under. But they were, uh, I believe, they they are uh, now part of, uh, they were purchased by another bigger um, 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 kind of public performance uh, service like that. Um, Mood does a great job of you know this mall uh, um, you know, positioning of, of, of music video services. Um, so a lot of artists don't realize that number one, it's actually easier to get on these services than it is to get on TV. Um, you actually reach way more consumers than you would possibly reach on TV in a, in a long-term standpoint. Um, and because of a captive audience, you don't have to do any work in terms of driving them to your video. They're already there. Yeah. Uh, so it's a great way to generate exposure. You know, one of our outlet partners is Schmack U. And Schmack U um, has 185 college campuses in the network generating you know over you know 35 million views a month i think it's about i think about 40 45 million views now a month uh, and these are college students these are the people that you want to reach who are consuming music who are buying music who are streaming music who are going to youtube to discover new artists and to share music um so that's one of our partners um chic shoes obviously our, our retail partner uh, uh you know you target a retail chain 100 over 130 locations across the u.s 1.2 to 1.7 million consumers per month walking through the store. Uh, so that's a lot of uh, exposure for our artists. We've seen some of our content owners increase their social media engagement as a result of campaigns on our platform because people see the video, they want to know more about the artists or, or listen to more of their music, so they go back and find them on YouTube. They've commented. I mean, we've got screenshots from artists saying, hey, you know, someone commented on our YouTube channel, they said they saw the video at the store, they liked it, so they went to our channel, they wanted to hear more. So yeah, we, we, we've been able to drive traffic to social media as a as a consequence of being on our, on our, on our, on our platform. We don't deal directly in the social media strategy um, um, part, but there are, there are opportunities to uh, kind of drive that traffic. Um, for our screens and retail stores, um, bands and artists can put uh, an ad next to their video. Normally, they put the artwork, the cover art of the song, but I recommend maximizing that space. Put your social media you know, handles on there um, or a hashtag if you're releasing an album. Utilize that to you know, capture the audience and drive that 1.7 million eyeballs back to your social media. So we've seen um, you know, artists 
take advantage of the, of, of, of the, the real estate on the screen in addition to their music video being there. Are you doing any consulting, social media consulting, besides uh, what you do with Chasbo? Um, yeah, on a case by case basis, um, you know, I've sat down with, for example, uh, Side One Dummy Records, which is a you know really cool independent um, rock label um, based here in Hollywood, um, and just you know, uh, I sat down with their GM and kind of went over some of the, the, the YouTube uh, uh, strategy a bit. Didn't spend too much time there, but. Um, a lot of individual bands and artists, you know, dealt their social media, helping them with social media strategy. Um, obviously, I speak on social media um, on panels in regards to social media marketing and, and ways to optimize your campaigns. Um, I don't. I mean, there's some brands that I work with. I've been working with for a, a number of months, actually over, over a year and a half now, um, that are not quite music brands, but mm -hmm. uh, they are a brand. Um, and music is a part of their DNA. Um, so we've done uh, cross-promotional campaigns with music and, and their products uh, in the social media space. Well, you, you are um, a social media expert, so you know you should be spreading that knowledge. That's uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, you mentioned about optimizing social media strategy. What would that be? Well, it, it depends on any of, I think a lot of artists one of the challenges with social media is that artists use social media as individual consumers, mm -hmm. just like everybody else. And so then they use it as their band, as individual consumers. You know, they don't have much strategy. You don't look at analytics on your own Facebook page because Facebook doesn't provide it. So you're not used to looking at numbers uh, from a business perspective on your own social media because it's not provided. Um, well, on Facebook particularly not provided and neither you know, does Instagram provide it. Um, although there are other platforms like Statagram uh, that, that provides it. Um, so what, we, what you try to do is, you know, social media has to be a part of the ongoing conversation with your target audience, your fans, and it has to be a part of your overall marketing strategy for, you know, releases, on tours, things like that. Um, so when I sit down with an artist or a band, I try to figure out, you know, what's what are we trying to promote in the first place? Is this, a, is this a particular campaign where there's a start date and end date, or is this an ongoing overall content strategy? You know, and then I evaluate you know, what's happening today. When are your fans engaged the most on your platform? Look at your day party. You know, what time of day do you see the most uh, engagement on your platform? Which 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 Facebook provides that information. Um, also important, in which which I, I I think a lot of independent artists need to realize is that. Even on, on, on all the social media, YouTube, Facebook, you know, Twitter, you have you know your your top five or ten countries of engagement, and um, I think if, if people played around, if fans played around with posting some content uh, in, a, in a different language, sometimes that may engage your, your second or third top country a little bit better as well. Um, so you know, those are just strategies to test and see if it works and then what kind of impact it has. Um, but yeah, you know, setting objectives, uh, setting goals. You know, if, if if your goal is about increasing your likes or your followers, you know, set targets. You know, in the next few months, we want to increase it by five percent, ten percent, whatever the case may be, and then create plans towards those targets. You know, okay, so now we know we want to increase it by five or ten percent. This is the actual quantity of likes that that that, that five or ten percent represents. And here are different tactics tactics to reach an audience and then try to convert them into likes. Um, and it's not just about promoting, you know, uh, spot dates and promoting album releases, but it's about, it's about engaging uh, your your uh, your fans and um, and providing content that they think is engaging uh, beyond your music. Um, I tell artists all the time, you know, especially independent emergent artists who don't have a big fan base, when you're doing promotions on social media, your music may not have the same uh, impact uh, as a bigger band uh, in terms of, for example, just giving your music away for free may not have the same impact of Maroon 5 giving their music away for free. Yeah. So um, you have to look at other, other ways to uh, increase you know, the, the response rate for, for your promotion. So even you know, a Best Buy gift card, you know, doing a sweepstakes to give away a Best Buy gift card, enter to win a $25 iTunes gift card. Uh, or enter to win, you know, 
Beat by Dre headphones, whatever the case may be, even though these are other products, the idea is that you have something that the consumer uh, uh, desires um, much more than your music. I mean, they, they desire the music, you're, they're a fan, but the reality is, until you're selling, you know, selling tickets to shows, until you're selling a lot of music, just giving away free music may not be enough to increase and to boost, uh, I think, your, your engagement on a daily basis. I just read just this morning that when you post on Facebook that last year you were reaching 12% of your audience and now it's down to 6%. So, and this is, of course, not a promoted post and we're not talking about Facebook advertising, but it's becoming more and more difficult to engage that fan base that you have on, on Facebook. Is that something that you're encouraging people you talk to you talk are you telling them that they should be there or not be there or concentrate in other places instead right um well yeah so two two responses to that number one i think that engagement rate is actually lower i think the six to twelve percent is actually uh, uh that's actually higher than i've seen um, with some of the brands that i deal with the bigger brands, brands who have one hundred thirty thousand followers you know their engagement rate is around one or two percent uh, or the reach, the reach, I'm sorry, is around Yeah, the, the reach we're talking about, not engagement, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's not, not engagement. Their reach is about one, for two, one and two percent. And, you know, and I, you know, a lot of people in the, in the social media space understand what's happening ever since those, you know, Facebook open graph and, 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 and obviously optimizing ad revenue. You know, you, it kind of hurts, obviously it hurts the band. If you post something about your upcoming spot date, and you only you only reach six percent of your followers, then you're not the page is not servicing is not serving the purpose of why it existed in the first place. Um, so there are some organic ways of working working to get that number up, and then obviously there's paid ways of working to get that number up. And in terms of organic ways, content strategy is important. Content strategy doesn't only include what kind of content but when and how you post it. Hmm. So that's when you have to look at, again, the day party, look at the numbers as far as what time of day, what days of weeks are the, have the highest impact. So that when you're posting about, you know, if, if, if the lowest time of your week is 11 p.m. on a Tuesday, and you're posting your new show 11 p.m. on Tuesday, then you're really gonna get the lowest reach. Uh, but if you see, okay, Thursdays and Wednesdays are the highest days of the week, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. is the best window. Let me optimize my posting, making sure it's scheduled to go those times and those days. Um, so, you know, looking at uh, the content strategy can uh, effectively help increase that, that reach, uh, the organic reach. Um, secondly, you know, making sure you post content that is um, compelling. If you want to increase your engagement, um, which is also gonna help with your reach, then you need to post content that's compelling. You know, I've looked at some uh, a recent uh, potential client of mine. I just evaluated their Facebook page, and I went through the last three months looking at all their posts, seeing what had the highest likes and shares. And for them, what you know, what had the highest likes and shares were um, memes, were inspirational memes for this particular brand. So you know, the memes don't do anything for self promoting their products or selling their products, but it does a lot for building the engagement rate and building the uh, and, and building the organic reach on their page. So, you know, my, my recommendation is to, okay, let's post a little bit more of what's working and to make sure that you time the stuff that's not necessarily working closely to what's working so that you're, you're leveraging that momentum and you're kind of bringing those eyeballs over to the content that's not getting love. Um, so, you know, bands can do that. They can sit down and look at the analytics on their page. They can see what day of the weeks are working the best, what times of the day are working the best, and make sure that they're posting content that um, is uh, within that time frame. You were kind enough to contribute to my Music 4.0 book, and there's an interview in there with you. And I guess it was about a year ago we did it. And then you were saying about how impressed you were with the then it was the new MySpace. How do you feel about it today? I still think MySpace is a great platform. Um, you know, I got the I got the personal walkthrough by the director of artist relations, um, and I, I still deal with the team today. As you know, MySpace is one of our content partners at Chasuble Music. Um, 
but even if they even if they weren't, I've looked at what they provide, what they offer in terms of their suite of features. It's absolutely by far the best platform for a musician to date that exists. Um, the way you can present your content, you know, the, the beautiful design of it, um, the way you can organize your content. Um, so they have a lot of features uh, in the platform. One of their challenges, which you know they're aware of, and I think everyone is aware of, is getting over the MySpace, you know, 2003 to whenever it kind of fizzled out, 2008, I believe, 2007, um, getting kind of over uh, that brand image of what that MySpace was at the time, and communicating, and this is something I've, I've, I've said several times at MySpace, is that we need to do a better job of communicating to independent artists what do you have to offer and how to integrate that into your, your overall digital strategy. They've been horrible and, at it, yeah. I've made recommendations. I think the team is. I think the team is great over there. I think they're, you know they're great with working with artists and what they're doing. Um, but it is a challenge. I think you know um, you know one of their opportunities is is doing a better job with educating independent artists not only on what MySpace has to offer, but how to integrate that into what you're currently doing. That's the one of the key parts of any kind of social media strategy is that you have to know how to use all these platforms together um, into some cohesive you know, uh, uh, plan. And if you look at MySpace as kind of this standalone, completely outside of the space, um, the social media bubble um, platform, a platform that you know, already has kind of a brand and an experience um, um, hurdle to get over from the consumers using it in the past, uh, and don't get me wrong, MySpace is still being used by millions of people every day around the world. Uh, but I think in the music community, um, especially in independent artists, people, because they're not seeing other artists use it, they're not using it. Um, so, you know, I think MySpace, you know, one of their opportunities is to, is to create a really strong campaign of next year. And I've made recommendations as far as, you know, being part of music festivals and, and, and doing seminars and, you know, workshops and just, you know, I invited um, um, Rosalind, uh, who at the time was a director of artist relations, to a panel that I curated um, on social media, and uh, you know she was able to participate in the panel and so more things like that to kind of get back in the face of the of the entire community. Um, I think they've done a great job as an entertainment and content hub, um, but I still think there's definitely a challenge with connecting with independent artists, showing the features that they have to offer, and making. Uh, making sure the artist knows how to integrate that in, into a marketing plan. Yeah, the visibility is very low, that's for sure. Um, there's two strategies, I think, on an artist using social media. One says, uh, concentrate on the platform that you know best or you like best or feels best to you and, and don't worry about the others. And, and then the other strategy is, okay, use a number of them all together. Which, where do you come down on that? Um, I definitely think um, you can use too little and you can use too many platforms. Um, I think you look at the top platforms in the country where you are, which is an important key word, you know, the key thing in the country where you are, because there are other, you know, there's other countries where, you know, there's other versions of what well, we have Twitter here and there's, and, uh, and other versions of, you know, our Facebook and, you know, China has their own uh, social media. And, it's other kinds of on social media. So look at the top platforms where you are. Um, and I mean, the reality is you only have so much time in a day um, to manage and to optimize and to, you know, be on these platforms all the time. If you're a band, it's a little bit easier if you have multiple members, but when you're a solo artist, it's definitely a challenge. Um, you know, I've seen solo artist pages where they may be able to post once or twice a week on Facebook. Um, and their Twitter, they use it as their personal and their artist Twitter. So you have all these tweets that have nothing to do with their music career at all. Yeah. Um, you know, combined with, you know, oh, by the way, I'm doing a show next Wednesday. So it's it's definitely a challenge when you have um, a solo artist. Uh, bands are a little bit easier because the band has a profile on all these pages as, as the band. And then the individual members have their own personal uh, profiles that they could communicate, you know, if they want to, the, the band information. But people will go to the band's page. So I think independent artists that are solo artists need to look at that strategy as well, make sure you have a, a separate page for music. But 
Yeah, I definitely think MySpace, Instagram, Twitter, you know, uh, Facebook, and YouTube are you know are, are the five consumer-facing platforms that are necessary to use in the U.S. Uh, then you have Reverb Nation and SoundCloud and some other uh, platforms. SoundCloud, you know, is, is not social media traditionally, uh, but it is a huge platform for music discovery yeah. uh, and showcasing your music. And I think uh, it's also important for the music business and music industry, music professionals, because when you send me your SoundCloud, and I see that you have all these views and comments that tells me that people are engaging your content um, or listens and that tells me that people are engaging your content and that um, not only engagement, but, but, but it, it sparks a response, which is important. Um, so yeah, I definitely don't think um, you know, 10 platforms are necessary. Um, I think you need to really evaluate the time that you have to, to dedicate to the platforms um, and then choose you know, the top three to five that you know, has the, uh, the, the biggest audience for your style of music. Final question. What's the best piece of advice, of business advice, that you've received, ever received, or that you've learned along the way? The best piece of business advice, and I'm not sure if it's just business or just in general, but I've learned along the way as I've received is, is never to uh, burn a bridge. Networking is the number, number one thing in this business, um, not just your talent. People can be talented but not have the connections. Um, and they can have the connections but not have the kind of the, the weight of the relationship, the depth of the relationship. Um, so I think you know, networking and, and never burning bridges is, is, is one, you know, will take you a very long way. Um, I mean, obviously you and I met, we've networked and we've collaborated on a bunch of different opportunities since we've met. Um, you know, similarly with other people I know in the music industry, not only the business side, but you know, musicians as well. Musicians, musicians who've got um, benefits from me because they've met me and, and, and maintained their relationships and I've been able to help them out in some way or another. So I think networking um, and, 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 and um, never burning bridges. And then on the flip side, more directly towards business, is learn as much as possible. Uh, you know, I recommend your books all the time. I, was just, I, just, I just had a meeting yesterday with an artist manager who's, whose art is moving here from North Carolina this weekend. And I said, well, there's two things you need to do. You need to have a boot camp with her, to sit down and go over and kind of learn about this music industry and this environment here in Los Angeles, which is coming from. North Carolina, and the second thing you need to do is get the Music 4.0 book and get the social, media marketing, the social media marketing book because you have to constantly educate yourself um, in this industry. It's, it changes. It changes all the time. I mean, you know this as an author. You write something and the moment it's published, it's already changed. Because all too well, I know, yeah. <laughs> so, something's new. So, um, but it's, it's not about learning specifically the, the, the little nuances. It's about understanding the philosophies behind how things work. And that's what I'm about learning. Because you can change something, you can change the way we measure something via metrics, but it's understanding what that metric represents and how that translates to sales or to capturing the audience and things like that. So it's kind of underlying, it's understanding the overall philosophies of you know, what's, what's the engine behind this music ecosystem. Uh, you know, within your segment of it, whether you're in touring, or your you know, live performance or recorded music, whatever the case may be. Um, so I think constantly educating yourself, whether it's traditional education or it's you know self-education via books like yours or blogs, um, and, and just being on top of networking events and, and stuff like that is, is important. Well, this has been great. It's been a great conversation as always. I always enjoy speaking to you. Thank you for being with me today. Absolutely. Thank you. And sorry I was a little late. <laughs> no problem. If you want to find out more about Day Bogan, go to daybogan.com. That's D-A-E-B-O-G-A-N, one word, dot com, D-A-E-B-O-G-A-N, daybogan.com. Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, send them to questions at bobbyoinnercircle.com. Many thanks to Steve Cherubino, who's the host of The Producer Podcast at theproducer.com. Dot club. That's the producer, T H E P O R D U C E R dot club, C L U B. To listen to other episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab, or go to bobbyoinnercircle.com, or you can find it on iTunes or Stitcher. At bobbyosinski.com, there's a sign up sheet for my newsletter and for alerts for new podcasts. Bobby.
This is Bobby Osinski. See you next time.